just open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, without you we can do nothing. And so I pray that you will be with us in spirit and that your angels will accompany us. In Jesus' name, amen. I've titled this, The Commandments of God and the Faith of Jesus. And that basically is the marching order that we have for the time that we live in. Of course, these verses occur in the book of Revelation, where it says, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus are pivotal to the times we are living in. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is the true test. But it seems as if many people are trying to introduce new tests. So if the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus is going to be the final test for the people of God on this planet, then we can expect that the enemy will introduce many winds of doctrine to try and divert minds away from this central theme. Now when we talk about the faith of Jesus, it's interesting that the Bible consistently uses this terminology, the faith of Jesus. But most people, and some modern translations, prefer to phrase it the faith in Jesus. Now, there's quite a difference between the two. The one obviously implies that you have faith in someone that will save you. But the faith of Jesus implies much more. Now, Jesus was absolutely convinced that he was going to save us. And therefore, his faith was to save God's people. But his faith was so strong that he was prepared to go to the cross for the sake of this faith, even to the point of dying the death of eternal separation from his Father. So, the faith of Jesus is much stronger and embodies far more complex issues than the faith in Jesus. Now, this message, which will be the test for the end of time, is the one that needs to come before the people. Because there will be an issue such as the mark of the beast, which will be propagated in the world, and certainly this revolves around the commandments, because the mark of the beast is, according to their own interpretation, the fact that they have taken the seal of God, which is in the fourth commandment, and transferred the solemnity to the first day of the week, thus making of non-effect the commandment of God, which commemorates creation and restoration. Whereas the new commandment, which commemorates the first day of the week, doesn't commemorate creation, doesn't commemorate uh, recreation, but is an embodiment of a continual sacrifice in the form of the Mass, when the Bible quite clearly says that by one sacrifice, he has forever fulfilled the obligations of the law. There is no continual sacrifice. So this is the issue that has to come before the people, and God's people in the end will choose between these two options, the commandments of men and the commandments of God. Now, when we look at prophecy, it is obvious that when we look at the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13, and all of these issues, that the great clash will come between religious systems where the law of God, the commandments of God, are central in this debate and in this clash. But today we have people preaching that the great fulfillment of prophecy is to be expected in a literal Israel, for example. And we have people within our own ranks who are beginning to preach that the new rise of the Turkish issues and the caliphate that they want to introduce there and the rising power of Erdogan in this concept is an indication that we're getting closer to the time when Israel 
will be encompassed by the king of the north, whom they claim to be the king of Turkey. And then when all these issues arise around a literal Jerusalem, well, then we will know that we are close to the end of time. Is this really the case? Now, they base this on a prophecy or a book written on prophecy by Uriah Smith, which had many, many beautiful truths in it and which was endorsed at the time that it was written, but it wasn't accepted by all. For example, James White did not accept that very philosophy and uh, he publicly stated the case. And it's a very interesting history because he was rebuked for doing so, not because of what he said, but because of how he did it. And there's a difference. And now it's easy to say, well, he was rebuked, therefore he must have been wrong. We read in uh, the Review and Herald, the time has come when we cannot depend upon the doctrine which comes to our ears unless we see that it harmonizes with the word of God. There are dangerous heresies that will be presented as Bible doctrines and we are to become acquainted with the Bible so that we may know how to meet them. The faith of every individual will be tested and everyone will pass through a trial of close criticism. Because Satan misquotes the scriptures. All should become familiar with God's word because Satan perverts and misquotes scripture and men follow his example by presenting parts of the word of God to those whom they wish to lead in false paths. Withholding the part which should spoil their plans, all have the privilege of becoming acquainted with the plain, thus says the Lord. So there will be false shepherds, some things will be read, some things will be unread, and as we approach the close of time, I am convinced that a good strategy of an enemy would be to present so many false scenarios that it's difficult to choose between the various ones as to what the real test is going to be. Because many apparently good things will need to be carefully considered as we look at all these diverging pathways. So is Erdogan the new rising king of the north and a caliphate which will be developed? And are the issues, as the dispensationalist theology seems to suggest, really those which concern a literal Jerusalem? I'm asking myself, what does the word desolate mean? When Jesus said, your house has been left to you desolate, what does that mean? It means that it's empty. There's nothing there anymore. And when we study the prophecies, and we look at the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and we see what happened, that uh, Jesus, when he was resurrected, still said to his disciples, go ye first to the lost children of Israel. And the disciples were only preaching to Israel and to no one else. But then as the time prophecy came to an end and that clock struck with the stoning of Stephen, then the gospel suddenly went to the Gentiles. So it is amazing to me when I look at the character of God that probation didn't close with the crucifixion, but that there were another three and a half years for the gospel to go exclusively to the Jews. And then Peter had a vision of the unclean sheets coming down, and three times he was told to take and eat. And he said, not so, my Lord, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean in all my life. But the voice consistently told him that he should not call unclean what God had declared clean. So when he was still thinking about the vision, there was this knock on the door and the three emissaries of Cornelius were standing in front of the door. 
And he realized what the vision meant, packed his bag, and went with them. And when he arrived at Cornelius' house, he said, you know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with a non-Jew. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out, and they received the Holy Spirit, and he returned to the disciples who rebuked him for what he had done. And when he explained it, he, they said, so just as we have received the Holy Spirit, so they received the Holy Spirit. So therefore, the gospel must now be available to the Gentiles. And at the same time, Paul is called into the ministry, and Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. So the time of the Jew had come to an end, and the time for the Gentiles to be the harborers of the gospel message of salvation had been transferred from Judaism to the Gentiles. And since then, this time has been progressing. Now when will the time of the Gentiles come to an end? Well, there must be a parallel, right? There must be a parallel between what happened before and what happens in the future. Why did it come to an end? Firstly, the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. But that didn't end their probation yet. But when, after three and a half years of preaching the gospel, they picked up stones to start destroying the new messengers, typified by Stephen, that's when their probation ended and the gospel went to the Gentiles. So, antitypically, when the Gentile world says, we have no king but Caesar, we'll come to the same point that the Jews were at the cross. When they start picking up the antitypical stones and start throwing them or wanting to throw them, at those who bring the final message, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, then their probation will close. Now I believe we're very close to that time period and uh, our focus should be absolutely on the events that are happening in the future. And we need to know where we stand in this issue. Who is the king of the north? Well, who was the king of the north when Jerusalem was destroyed? Wasn't it uh, the king of Babylon? And didn't Jeremiah say uh, that there is an enemy coming out of the north and that he will destroy Jerusalem? Exactly that is what happened. So the king of Babylon in the end of time, according to Protestant interpretation, is the papacy. And uh, we even read in the Bible that Peter refers to Rome as the new Babylon. So this was the papacy and this was the understanding. But uh, many of the pioneers believed that the king of the north was Turkey. So one of the messages that came to, to James White were quite astounding. So one of the testimonies delivered most likely in an oral form was addressed to James White, a reproof for his course of action just before the combined camp meeting and general conference session. He and Uriah Smith held conflicting views on the prophecy of the King of the North, pictured in Daniel chapter 11. And he then in his Sabbath morning address on September the 28th, newly pitched camp meeting tent, countered Smith's interpretation. He felt that Smith's approach indicating that the world was on the verge of an Armageddon would threaten the strong financial support needed for the rapidly expanding work in the church. And so he addressed it in a public fashion. And it was this, uh, this discontent and this animosity between the two views which led to the rebuke. At no time was the rebuke, however, with regard to what he said, only to how he said it. Antitypically, the king of the north can only be, if we draw a parallel, 
Rome, the king of Rome. And that must be the Pontifex Maximus. That is central to this theology. So now when we are looking at the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, suddenly every wind of doctrine comes into play within our ranks and people make this pivotal and part of a salvational issue. And the question is, do we have the time for this division within our ranks? Is it important to have inreach within the church in order to get the church into a state so that Jesus can come? Must we become the perfectors of the saints? And the answer is, no, that's not my work. The work of the perfecting of the saints belongs to God. Jesus is the one who must do the perfecting. We can say and talk about the issues, about what is right and what is wrong, but whether someone applies it to the heart is not something that we are capable of doing. And is it necessary that we tell people that they reach this standard of character or that standard of character before Jesus can return? Well, the answer is we have no such work to do and that is a quote directly from the spirit of prophecy. So leave the perfecting of the saints to God. So is it a salvational issue whether I understand the nature of Christ, for example, in the exact same fashion as someone else? And this becomes pivotal and the debate as to whether I am in the right or wrong standing with God? Or is it absolutely necessary, I'm now mentioning the things that are coming into the church, that I understand fully how to pronounce the name of God or how to address him? Do I have the correct Hebrew pronunciation? Or do I have a correct understanding of the Trinity? How many people are so engaged in arguing about the correct understanding of the Trinity or the nature of the Godhood if for 6,000 years nobody has, been nobody has managed to unravel that in its entirety up to this point? Whether I understand it exactly like this or like that, is that a salvational issue? As long as I understand that the Bible speaks about three persons of the Godhood, it speaks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that uh, my salvation is wrapped up in the blood of the Lamb, then that should be sufficient, precisely what the details are, or what is the nature of the Holy Spirit? This is another issue. If you do not understand it this way or that way, you cannot be part of the remnant. Is this really the issue? of the time we are living in? Can we determine exactly what the nature of the Holy Spirit is? Well, we read, when it comes to the nature of the Holy Spirit, silence is golden. We know that he works, he's like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from, but you can feel its effect. So is this an issue that we should be discussing and, and uh, arguing about and trying to unravel in order to be right with God. And then we have a huge faction in our ranks with their own television broadcasting systems where the feasts become the issue as to whether you are right with God or whether you are not right with God. Are the feasts the issue today or is the issue the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. So this really is an appeal to God's people to stop these inter-theological debates on all of these issues, making this aspect or that aspect or whatever aspect pivotal in terms of salvation. Are we right with God or are we not right with God? Very many will come up with some test that is not given in the word of God. Do we have the right understanding of the 2,520 days? What does that mean? Is there anything wrong when the dates, when you work them out and they come to 17, 8, 
98 and to 1844, is it now absolutely essential that we take that and say, if you do not have the correct understanding of this issue, then you will not be saved. Is this the test that is coming upon God's people? Now don't get me wrong. I've never claimed that it's wrong to study the Bible and to study the issue on the nature of God and the, the nature of the Godhead and all of these issues. And if you want to unravel the feasts and how they work, etc., they're in the Bible. It's a biblical study. But is that the issue that confronts us at this very time? Is this the central theme around which everything revolves? If you have a hobby and you want to study something out, do it by all means, but don't come on the stage and say, say I have unraveled something and if you don't come up to my position, you will be lost. Because that doesn't make any sense. We have very specific instructions. I'm not saying the, the one is wrong or not wrong, I'm just talking about the centrality of the argument. So very many will come up with some test that is not given in the Word of God. We have our test in the Bible. The commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is the true test. But many other tests will arise amongst God's people. There will come in multitudes springing up from this one and that one there will be a continual rising up of some foreign thing to call attention from the true test of God. Now the interesting thing is every single one that I've mentioned thus far comes from the ranks of the conservatives. Then I haven't even mentioned the <laughs> those that come from the ranks of the, of the liberal factions where you have spiritual formation and emerging church theology and uh, the church is the glue that will glue everyone together rather than the haven, the remnant to each everyone must uh, emulate. So we have a massive infiltration of theological ideologies within the church, all designed, in my opinion, to distract from the core of what the issue really is. This is the only test. We are to preach the warning against the child of the papacy which undermines these principles. So what is the test? Why is the Sabbath the test? Is it just a question of a day? Why should the Sabbath be so pivotal? Well, we know that the Sabbath was introduced in Eden and that... Uh, long before the commandments were codified by Moses, the Sabbath was central. We know that the Sabbath was kept before the commandments were given because otherwise the Jews, when they were taken out of Egypt, still marching towards Sinai, couldn't have been tested as to whether they will walk in his law or not, the Sabbath being the one issue that was used in order to, to do this. And... Uh, then the manna that fell, that fell for six days, and on the sixth day, double fell and lasted through the Sabbath, whereas it went rotten every other day, the Sabbath was central throughout history and it reminded us of where we come from and it reminded us of where we are going. And of course, the Sabbath is the commandment of righteousness by faith because I cannot contribute to my creation. Not one iota. And I cannot contribute to my salvation, because if I'm dead in transgression, there's no way I can resurrect myself and become alive on this test. So the Sabbath, by keeping it, I acknowledge that I'm his by creation, and I acknowledge that through faith I am his, by redemption. The Sabbath is the commandment of the acknowledgement of righteousness by faith, more than any other. And this is the pivotal point of the issue for the time we are living in. When we turn our minds back to the Reformation, 
What was the issue that flamed and powered the Reformation? What did Martin Luther discover that blew the entire concept that he had before apart? What did, what did he discover? Righteousness by faith. He read the book of Romans and realized that all his self-flagellation was totally useless. Righteousness by faith was the issue. And righteousness by faith has been buried again under a pile of rubble and will be the issue again at the end of time. So now Satan has developed all kinds of terminology accusing those who want to keep the commandments of God as legalists and those who keep the commandments are accusing those who don't keep the commandments as antinomians and never the two shall meet. In actual fact, they're basically uh, sides of the same coin. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ our righteousness. Now, how does that fit into the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Well, if you want to accept the righteousness of Christ, just as the reformers had to break totally free from the chains that bound them, we will have to become new bottles and have a new understanding of exactly what this means and why the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are pivotal in this debate. This is very, very important. Genesis chapter 26 verse 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So obviously, if Abraham was saved, not by works, but by faith, then what do we do with that verse? They say that there were no commandments, but uh, the verse clearly says that he kept the commandments, and he kept the statutes, and he kept the laws. And if we go down through the types that we have thereafter, then we'll see that David was a type of Christ. And was he perfect? No, in his humanity he wasn't perfect. But as the king who sat on the throne of Jerusalem, he typified this new kingdom that was coming. And John 15 verse 10 says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. The type and the antitype cannot be divorced from each other. If it counts for the type, Abraham was a type of all that will be redeemed, well then it must apply to the antitype. We must keep the commandments, the statutes, and the laws. If Abraham did it, so must we. So what is this question of legalism, antinomianism, and all these factions that are arising in the church? It seems that some must follow Paul, and some must follow Apollos, and some must follow whosoever, or is there one truth? Satan is used as agents, individuals professing to believe a part of present truth while they were warring against another part. And these can be used more successfully than those that say they're not part of the faith. The present truth is not difficult to understand and the people whom God is leaving will be united upon the broad, firm platform he will not use individuals of different faith, opinions, and views to scatter and divide. There is one central truth, and that is righteousness by faith. Now, a man by the, Johann, by the name of Johann Christian Nell wrote me an article, or sent me an article, which I, which I read, and I found it very interesting. And uh, I'll quote a little bit from his work. It says, what is the most important question in the world? I would like to know that. 
What is the most important question in the world? And he writes, It is accepted by scholars that Job, the oldest book in the Bible, and therein Job asks the most important question which a man or woman can ask him or herself. In Job 9 verse 2 he asks, How should a man be just with God? And in Job 25 verse 4, How then can man be justified with God? So the Greek word for just can also be translated innocent. So how can I stand innocent before God? And the Greek word for justify can also be translated to regard as just, innocent or righteous. So how can I be shown to be just with God? And just like Martin Luther discovered this great truth, so we have to pack it into a new framework for the time we are living in with all the onslaughts that are coming. And in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, Paul unequivocally says, It is not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now let me repeat that. It's not the hearers of the law who are just, before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Thus Romans 2.13 means that not the hearers of the law are innocent or righteous before God, but the doers of the law shall be shown as regarded as innocent, declared righteous or innocent. Now, what is justification? Justification is a judicial act where judicially the one who is not righteous is covered by the cloak of Christ's righteousness and judicially declared justified. There is no act. There is nothing that you do in order to uh, gain this justification other than the fact that you have acknowledged your need. So the first step when asked, what shall we do to be saved? When the Jews asked that after the preaching of the disciples, what did Peter say? Repent. Repent. In other words, turn round. Don't go in the direction that you have been going. Turn round and go in the other direction. That's what it means. Repent. And then be baptized. In other words, have your sins washed away, typically, die to self and be resurrected in a new way of living with Christ. And that new way of living will be called sanctification. So justification, how do I know that I'm just with God? What will be the fruit of justification. Doing of the law. Because it's not the hearer of the law who will be justified. The hearer of the law will realize, I'm lost. What shall I do to be saved? And then repent. Turn around. Acknowledge the gift of salvation in the cross. And then... By walking in the commandments, you will have given evidence that you've had a, what does the Bible call it? Conversion. There's a change. And that is not too difficult to understand, but people make it so complicated that we do not know what is right and what is wrong anymore. And what is the difference between antinomianism and legalism? Because the modern theology of most evangelicals says the law has been done away with, it has been nailed to the cross. And that is called anomia, without the law of God. But here's my question. Are they without the law of God? If you confront them, then you say, okay, anomia. 
The law's been done away with. Is it okay to steal and rape and pillage and murder and do all that? No! So don't they have a law? Of course they have a law. And don't they even have a Sabbath? Yes, they have a Sabbath, but it's a transferred Sabbath. So what is this law that they actually have? Are they antinomium or do they have a law? They have a law. But it is a law of their own definition. A law which they apply according to their understanding of what it means to love God and to love your neighbor. And you bring the law down to the level of humanity. Are they adamant about their law? Absolutely. Will they go, according to scripture, to the point of persecuting those who do not go along with their declarations and understanding of the law? Yes or no? Yes. So an antinomian is not without law. An antinomian is as much with law as the so-called legalist. He just has his own law and his own interpretation. So if only those who bear the fruits bear fruit of justification, then how did you get to that point in the first place? And the answer is by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his capacity to save to the uttermost those that come to him. So everything starts with faith. You cannot, you cannot proceed on this road unless you start with faith. And the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. Impossible. Thus only those who possess faith are justified, declared righteous, and all those who possess faith are sanctified, in other words, start walking according to the statutes of God as Christ enables them. But if the path of the just is the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day, then obviously this is a process which takes some time. And uh, if we look at these issues of legalism and antinomianism, then it becomes very fascinating indeed. You see, legalism is the reverse coin. There are legalists even in our own ranks, but the legalism teaches that a fallen man and a woman is able to perfectly keep the law for their justification. That's a legalist. Can I keep the law for my justification? No. I cannot keep the law for my justification because I'm a sinner and incapable of keeping the law for my justification. My only hope is that through faith, Christ's righteousness will be imputed to me. So legalism says, watch me. I'm keeping the commandments perfectly. According to whose standard? Your standard. Isn't that exactly the same as antinomianism? Who also have a law according to their standard. So if somebody says to you, look, it is possible to be perfect, just look at me, I am perfect, I'm not doing this anymore, or that anymore, or the other anymore, then just say, oh brother, there's no hope here, because the one is probably worse than the other. It's the reverse coin of exactly the same thing. So there are two false gospels in the world today. The one is legalism, and the other one is antinomianism, and both have a law, but each one of them has defined the law according to his capacity and ability to keep it. But the law has a much higher standard than that. The law is the standard of God. It is something that is, according to Peter's ladder, something that we will be striving for and climbing for the rest of our lives, and without the indwelling spirit of Christ to clean up the heart, we might as well forget it in the first place. 
So what is righteousness by faith? What does it mean to be right with God? It means that you are covered with his perfect righteousness, that sanctification. And when you keep the commandments of God, not in your strength, but in his strength through his indwelling spirit, then you won't even know it. You will never think that you have aspired to that point. You will always regard yourself as shawling, falling short of the glory of God. So the Pharisee, who is a legalist, comes into the temple and says, Look at me, Lord. <laughs> I've achieved. Look at me. And that simple fellow there at the back, who can't, doesn't even have the guts to come to the front of the temple, well, I pity that old tax collector in the back there. That's legalism. And the one in the back who beats his breasts and says, Lord, I am a sinner. How am I ever going to be right with you? Forgive me. I am a transgressor of your law. He will go home justified. Self-justification is a denial of the righteousness of Christ. So what is righteousness by faith? It is the third angel's message in verity. What does that mean, in verity? The third angel's message in verity. It means that it is the essence of the third angel's message. Now when you look at it, you say to yourself, but how is that possible? The third angel says, do not accept the mark of the beast. And then it has a host of, of uh, admonitions and curses for those who actually accept the mark of the beast. Now how is that righteousness by faith in verity? Is it because I keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus that I am right with God. Not necessarily, because if I'm a legalist, how am I keeping the commandments? According to my definition of what the standard is that I need to reach. But when I realize that I'm a sinner, and I say to God, help me to live the best life that I possibly can, and to walk in your statues, and I open the door and I say, come in and clean the soul temple, and I walk in his strength, not trusting in my own, will I see the difference if I look at the two of them? Both of them are keeping the commandments of God. The one thinks he's reached it, and the other one thinks, how am I ever going to get there? So, these are interesting issues. And the righteousness of Christ is bound up in the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is the ultimate symbol of righteousness by faith. And when the test comes, when this law is made a universal law, then the true test of character will come to the fore. Because those who've set up their own standard will eventually capitulate. But those who cling to a higher standard and to the persona, who sets that standard, will be able to stand in his righteousness. Romans chapter 3 verse 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. When Martin Luther discovered these words, his soul was unburdened from this pressure that had been crushing him his entire life. And then these beautiful words, being 
justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus Christ. The same test that came to the Reformation is coming again. And the Reformers are on the verge of saying, we have no king but Jesus. Because the Reformed theology said, we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. The new doctrine on justification says, we are saved by Christ's saving works. And if you look at the treasury of uh, merit that is at the, at the disposal of the papacy, it doesn't only include the meritorious works of Jesus Christ, but of all the saints throughout all the ages. And it is this merit that he can apply in mercy. So he's the one who becomes the God of mercy, who saves to the uttermost whereas Jesus Christ is being bypassed. So when they changed the definition from justified through his blood through justified through his works, that's when they accepted the theology of Rome and rejected the theology of the Reformation and of the Bible. And that is the equivalent of saying we have no king but Caesar. When they finally get confronted with this issue and the Sabbath will be pivotal as the commandment which stands for righteousness by faith, they will pick up stones to get rid of the antitypical Stephens who are telling them that if you do not keep the commandments of God, you've never been justified in the first place. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. What will the antinomian say? He'll say, that's right, you're legalists, you're saying we must keep the commandments. But at the same time they'll want to pick up stones if you break their commandments. What the, will the legalist say? I'm justified by my keeping of the commandments. Well, then you don't have the righteousness of Christ and you are standing on a foundation of sand. No, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is true sanctification. Christ within me. And Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. So the scripture, according to Galatians 3.22, has concluded all under sin, that, but, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So when we get back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, where it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, this is the final issue, the final conflict. So we cannot have the feasts as a final conflict. We cannot have a theology on the Trinity, or the nature of Christ, or any one of those that will be pivotal at the end of time. And God's people should unite on the issue at hand, and not allow the devil to bring such confusion within our ranks that we do not know which way to turn our heads. 
His righteousness and faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. It always lies outside of myself. As soon as there is one tiny iota of hope that I am saved through anything that I have done, I'm lost. There is only one hope to be saved amply and fully and entirely by faith in Jesus Christ. Now Hebrews chapter 11 verse 30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. I find this rather fascinating. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. After they were compassed about seven days. Now let's go there, Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. And you shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once, thus shalt you do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Verse 5, And it shall come to pass, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. This is what happened in the type. So when they entered the promised land, the first confrontation was Jericho. Now if they compassed six days, and on the seventh day compassed seven times, it doesn't literally say which day you started. But it is possible that that seventh day is the Sabbath day, because somewhere in that cycle there was a Sabbath day. Now, in my personal opinion, and I'm not going to make this a doctrinal issue, and if you don't believe like I believe, then uh, you will be lost, because then I just add another category to the confusion that already exists in our ranks. But to me, it is perfectly logical that the day in which they compassed seven times and took the city was the Sabbath day. Now people will say, excuse me, isn't that contrary to God's actions and commandment? And doesn't it say, pray that your flight is not in the winter or on the Sabbath day? Uh, yes, but it doesn't say, pray that your deliverance is not on the Sabbath day. It says, pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath day. And between the flight and the deliverance, there's a time of trouble. So there's quite a gap between the two of them. So, is it possible that the deliverance comes on the Sabbath day? When did Jesus do most of his miracles to deliver people either from demonic possession or disease or any one of them? What, what day did he use? Sabbath. Did they accuse him then? What's the probability that they would accuse him again if he used the Sabbath day to deliver God's people in their entirety from the slavery that they have been in throughout all of these eons. Now, I'm not making a, a dogma out of it, but I'm just speculating. The Bible says, when he comes, he comes by way of the east, right? And uh, you wonder, why does he come by way of the east when the Bible clearly says his throne is in the north? Why would he come by way of the east? Well, the world is steeped in idolatry and sun worship is the basis of that idolatry. And sun worship was always, even to this day, towards the east. Isn't it fitting that the punishment due to that neglect of God should come from the very direction in which they hope to be delivered rather than to be punished? Well, how about the Sabbath then? Isn't it fitting 
that the very day that they despise the most is the day on which they receive their just reward. And then there's this interesting story of Jericho, where you had Rahab, and she was a prostitute, and she was saved. Now, a woman in the Bible is a what? Is a church. And a prostitute woman is a what? Idolatrous church. And isn't it possible that when this deliverance takes place, many that belong to apostate churches will have accepted the truth and will be delivered together with God's people at the end? Doesn't Rahab stand for the deliverance of those who come out of Babylon to stand with God's people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? This is the issue. Now there's another interesting point here. This ram's horn that was uh, blown, the word used there is jobale. Now apparently, if we look at the concordance, H2986, it's the blast of the horn from its continual sound, specifically the sound of the silver trumpet. Hence the instrument itself and the festival thus introduced was the jubilee, the ram's horn or the trumpet, from which we derive also from this word, the word jubilee, when the captives were set free. So there will come another jubilee when the Lord captives will be set free and the antitypical walls of Jerusalem will come tumbling down and the antitypical Rahabs, God's church made of the redeemed prostitutes, will be liberated. And how fitting that this should happen on the Sabbath day. So my appeal to this church is to get back to basics. Simple basics. And to preach that which this church has been preaching for over a century. That the final issue will be the righteousness of Christ. And that we stop arguing on this theology, that theology, this methodology or that methodology, but to concentrate on Galatians 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, when Christ lived on this earth, did he keep the commandments? I have kept my Father's commandments. If he lives in you, won't he induce you to keep his commandments? The commandments of God. How strong will your faith have to be in the face of persecution? Your faith will have to be so strong that you are willing to rather be sacrificed than to give up that faith. And that means you will have been sealed because to be sealed by definition means to be so settled in the truth that you cannot be moved. This is the issue of the time. We cannot look to Jerusalem because the faith of Jesus does not apply in Jerusalem. We cannot look to the king of the north because the commandments as, as, as Turkey because the commandments of God don't apply there. So where can I look? I can only look at the Christian world. So who can the king of the north be? Can only be the king of the papers, of the Christian world, which is the papacy, the new Caesar, the new Pontifex Maximus who takes his seat on his great white throne, surrounded by the cherubim, and takes the place of God. So this is the issue. Do we keep his commandments? The antinomian definition of your own understanding and concept of the law, or not. Now, if we read what humanism has to say, then it becomes clear. According to the International Humanist and Ethical Union, Bylaw 5.1, humanism 
is a democratic and ethical life stance which stands for an ethic based on human and other natural values in the spirit of reason and free inquiry through human capabilities. As an ethical doctrine, it, humanism, affirms the dignity and worth of all people and the ability to determine right and wrong purely by appeal to universal human qualities, especially rationality. It endorses universal morality based on the commonality of the human condition. This is exactly the same lie that Satan preached in Eden, that you will be able by yourself to decide and to distinguish between good and evil. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, rebukes all of those principles. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. May we stand united as we face the final conflict, which I am convinced will take place shortly. Amen. Amen.